Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, so on behalf of the College of Law, on our community's behalf, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the John W. Fisher, Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine. This endowed lecture is another of our Dean's Enrichment Series. It is the final one of the year, and it uh, consists primarily of lectures featuring prominent legal academics and practitioners who make presentations in their areas of expertise. And by sharing their expertise, they help us all increase and deepen our knowledge, which is what legal education is all about. The John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine was established through the, generos the generosity of Thomas S. Clark, MD, and Jean Clark, and is part of the Clark Family Lecture Series, funded by a half million dollar pledge made in 1998. The pledge supports lectures in 10 fields of study throughout West Virginia University, and we're proud to have this event as our part of this lecture series. The interdisciplinary nature of this lecture is both timely and appropriate, uh, because the fields of law and medicine have so much overlap, and both face so much uncertainty. Healthcare options, uh, both in types of delivery and services, are rapidly changing in our state, our nation, and the world. Our state of West Virginia has deep needs and deep challenges in the areas of law and medicine, and this lecture series is just one part of helping to develop and expand the dialogue on these critically important topics. So it is thus highly appropriate that the lecture is named after John W. Fisher II, who was a member of the College of Law faculty from 1968 to 2014, and who served as Dean of the College of Law for 10 years. Uh, dean Fisher, who retired in 2014, is the William J. Mayer, Jr. Dean Emeritus, and the Robert M. Steptoe and James D. Steptoe Professor of Property Law Emeritus, and his countless contributions to the College of Law, to the legal profession, um, and the state of West Virginia are indicative of the College of Law's continued and distinguished legacy of service. And I am proud, uh, like so many others here at the College of Law, to call him my friend, uh, my mentor, and my colleague. And we're very honored to have Dean Fisher with us today. Dean Fisher in the back row there. Thank you very, very much for uh, your decades of service to the university uh, and to this college. We are a better college and a better community because of your hard work. Thank you. I'm now pleased to introduce to you uh, my colleague, Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development, Josh Frasche, who will introduce our speaker uh, for this year's John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine. Josh. Thank you, Dean Bowman, and, and welcome to everybody. Uh, one of our goals this year with the Dean's Enrichment Series, uh, as always, was to bring speakers uh, recognized for their expertise. In addition, we tried to bring in speakers who can show you the wide variety of opportunities in practice that are available to you. Um, and I'm thrilled to introduce to you our 2018 Fisher Lecturer because she embodies all of these things. Uh, she is an expert. She is creative in her work as a lawyer and an advocate for public health and she works to serve and improve her community. Elizabeth Van Nostrand is an assistant professor in the Department of Health uh, Policy and Management at the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Health. She is also the director of Pitt's Public Health JDMPH program and serves as an adjunct professor in the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. She currently teaches public health and ethics, current issues in health law, and law and public health practice at both schools. As if that were enough, she is also an adjunct at Carnegie Mellon, uh, uh, as an adjunct instructor of health policy in the Heinz College. She's also the director of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Public Health Training Center, a Department of Health and Human Services funded organization to promote trainings for current and future public health workforce. In 2015, Professor Van Nostren was named a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellow for the Promotion of Public Health Law Education and she has consistently been recognized for her excel excellence and innovations in teaching uh, public health. Her research interests are vast and include emergency preparedness and uh, the opioid crisis, and in 2017, she received two awards with respect to the creation of ELI, an informatics tool developed for volunteers in disaster response. She won the National Partner Award from the National Medical Reserve Corps Program and the University of Pittsburgh's Innovator Award. If her name sounds familiar, it's because she also happens to be married to one of our resident and environmental law experts, Jamie Van Nostren, who's also the director of the Center for Energy and Sustainable Development. 
And while her credentials and achievements more than speak for themselves, I would be remiss not to note that, like me and my wife, she is a proud graduate of Tulane University Law School. It is my great pleasure to welcome Elizabeth Van Nostrand to WVU College of Law to present our 2018 Fisher Lecture in Law and Medicine. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I know that this is somewhat of a captive audience, but I'm, I'm glad to see all of you here today. Um, I usually love interruptions. I have four children, so I'm used to being interrupted pretty much all the time. However, because of the time limitations, I'm going to ask that you please um, keep your questions until the end, um, and then I, will, I would love to answer anything um, that you want to know about, about my work. Um, this is going to be a really a very different type of legal lecture. Um, we're not going to talk about law per se. We're going to talk about how you can use law to answer the question, is a law effective? Um, do laws make a difference? You know, with, a, with um, um, the gun safety issues that have been going around, a lot of people say, well, just enforce the laws that you have on the books. That's all you need to do. Um, but even if you do that, how do you know if they work? Um, so that's what I'm going to be um, talking about today. Um, as you've studied law, you know that they're sometimes written to be intentionally vague. They certainly weren't made to quantify and to create data from them. But that's exactly what we've been doing um, for about the last um, 10 years at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and it's really remarkable because even though I'm at Pitt Public Health, which is a school of science, I haven't taken a hard science class since I was a junior in high school. Um, so I'm also technologically challenged, so please be patient with me when I go from my presentation to show you my different tools, okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what public health is and what this... Um, amorphous area of legal epidemiology, what that actually means. And then I'm going to show you how I've coded some laws and created um, some tools to examine health outcomes. Uh, just by way, way of background, uh, this is our current health care system, um, what it looks like in terms of spending, and I will tell you right now that it's not sustainable. Um, so what do we have to do? We have to try to figure out what's working and what's not working. Um, if you look at this, the health spending in the United States as a share of GDP is somewhere between 16.4% and 17%. Um, the red mark, or the blue mark, I'm sorry, right there where it says OECD, that's the average of these nations, and it's about 8.9%. Uh, the next three highest, the United States is over there in the orange, the next three highest are the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Sweden, and they spend about 11%. Of, of GDP. And when you look at spending per person, that's over $7,900 a year per person in the United States do we spend on health care. Um, the global average is about $3,200. Um, so it's a total of about 2.5, um, will be a total of about $2.5 trillion. Um, oops. This just shows health spending over time. Um, when we look at laws and the effectiveness of law, you have to look at them longitudinally. So what happened in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, year seven, and this just shows you healthcare spending longitudinally. Um, as you can see, the United States is at the top, and although all countries are going up, it's going up at a much higher um, much higher rate. And about 75% of our healthcare dollars are spent on chronic diseases. Um, when you look at spending for healthcare versus social services, the U.S. again is an anomaly. Uh, in most other countries, for every dollar that is spent on healthcare, two dollars is spent on social services. In the United States, it's the opposite. For every dollar we spend on healthcare, we spend about 55 cents on social services. And when you look at government budget for public health, it's only about 3%. Um, even though we spend an awful lot of money on health, we do not have good health outcomes. Um, at the top, I realize this is kind of small, but at the top is Japan. Japan, if you look at life expectancy, has the longest life expectancy at about 82.7. 
um, years. Um, the red line is the average, and that's 79.3. The United States is significantly below that at 77.9. Um, so it's almost two years behind the average life expectancy and five years behind Japan. So what do I do? I look at public health. Um, and public health is the science of protecting and improving the health of people and their communities. So it differs from medicine. Um, I like to use this analogy. Um, when you go to the doctor, you are treated for, say, strep throat. That would be a clinical, um, clinical care for an individual. In public health, we look at epidemics. We look at Ebola. We look at health that affects communities rather than an individual. And there's four foci of public health. Um, one is it prevents poor health outcomes rather than treating them after they occur. Um, there's a very prominent role of the government in the public health system. Um, we look to develop interventions to limit health disparities, and we promote health equity and social justice. And I'll touch upon each of those areas briefly. With respect to prevention, uh, public health laws are both direct interventions as well as indirect regulations. So direct regulation in terms of public health would be things like helmet laws. And when I teach my class, it's kind of like a survey course. We have all these different topics. Helmet laws is one of them, and that's one of the most contentious. It always seems to, um, it, even more so than gun safety, which, which we also talk about. Um, so stuff like compulsory vaccination and isolation and quarantine, those would be direct public health laws. Um, indirect uh, regulation um, as it impacts public health would be stuff like um, fines for dumping pollutants in, in the river or uh, particulates in the air. Um, public health also focuses on educational programs, such as the um, correct um, usage of naloxone, which is the antidote um, for opioid um, um, overdose, um, maternal and child health services. Um, public health also administrates, administrates some clinical services, such as HIV AIDS clinics and sexually transmitted infection clinics. Um, we also do a bunch of research, um, which we'll get to in a minute. As I said, the government is the central player in the public health system, but not the only one. This is what the public health system looks like according to the CDC and others. I don't know if you can read all those labels, but as you can see, it's a very disjointed um, group of agents. Um, which includes clinical care, but goes beyond that. Um, one node that's not in the system is the judiciary. And I would advocate that the judiciary should also be a player in public health. In a few slides, I'm gonna talk about my phases project. I want you to remember this um, map when we, when we talk about it. Um, health disparities, what are health disparities? Are there a difference in health status between one population in comparison to a more advantaged group? Um, this map came out of VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. And what it does, it tells you the life expectancy outside of Richmond. So you can see in an area of about 12 miles apart, you have one group that whose life expectancy is 83 versus another group that is 63. So within a 12-mile difference, you have a 20-year difference in life expectancy. Um, so why is that? Well, a lot of it has to do with something called the social determinants of health. Um, these are the conditions in which people live, work, um, and age. Um, examples would be both biological and genetic um, differences, individual behaviors such as alcohol use, drug use, unprotected sex, smoking, um, overeating, the social environment. Do you live, um, do you live um, in an area that um, has lead in the water or pollutants in the air? And also the social environment. Um, are you a member of a class that is discriminated against? Um, income also plays a big role um, in the social determinants of health. When you look at the impact of different factors on the risk of premature death, 
Um, this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, so these are what contributes to premature death. Social determinants of health and behaviors are the greatest contributors to whether or not you're going to live a long time or not. Um, and as I said, in the US, the likelihood of premature death increases as your income goes down. Finally, health equity. This is the attainment of the highest degree of health for all people um, and the thought that everyone deserves um, a fair chance to lead a healthy life. Um, no, no one should be denied this because of their socioeconomic status um, or where they're living. Um, and this is the difference between equality and equity. Equality is giving everyone the same thing. So if you look at that upper level, you see different populations each getting the same size of bike. And guess what? One size fits all doesn't work in healthcare. Um, in terms of equity, that's giving people what they need to succeed and what they need to live a healthy life. And in this um, graphic, it is giving people the bikes that actually work for them rather than a bike, one bike fits all. The difference between what I teach and what Valerie Blake teaches. Um, or my colleague, Mary Crossley. I'm actually going to be teaching health law for the first time um, at our executive MBA program, so that will be fun for me to learn something different. Um, but the difference is health law basically is healthcare delivery. Um, and uh, Val, I'm sorry, public health is way more exciting because we, <laughs> um, we don't get down in the weeds in terms of insurance and licensure and fraud and stuff like that. We talk about isolation, quarantine, Zika versus Ebola, um, reproductive rights, gun safety. Um, so again, it's, it's health-related um, topics that affect entire communities rather than individuals. Okay, Are you all up to speed now? All righty. So let's talk about epidemiology. We talked about what public health law is, and now we're going to talk about the second part of what legal epidemiology is, and that's epidemiology. Epidemiology is a branch of health sciences. At the Graduate School of Public Health, we have six different schools or departments within our school. One is epidemiology, and it's the study of the causes, the distribution, and control of diseases in populations. Um, so this guy, this cartoon guy is Jon Snow, and he is thought to be the father of epidemiology. He was a physician in London in the 1800s, and there was a cholera outbreak in London. Cholera is, began in India, and it's a bacterial infection um, that appears with little or no warning, and it has a very high mortality rate, death rate. Um, <coughs> It, it kills about 50% of people who become infected with it. So there was an outbreak of about five, and it killed about 550 people in Soho. And Jon Snow wanted to know why. Because they didn't have the linkage between disease and health outcomes at the time. So this is what he did. He drew a map, not this exact map, but a map like this. And so he was looking at all the streets um, in the Soho area, and the little blue things represent where the water pumps were. And as you can see, he was looking at the cluster of people represented in red that were affected by cholera. And he noticed that in the central part, that blue um, uh, faucet up there, that's where most of or many of the cholera outbreaks occurred. So using epidemiological um, principles, looking at clusters, he was able to pinpoint that that's where the disease was from. He um, encouraged the, the powers that be to remove the handle from the water well. And guess what? Virtually no more people got sick. So that is what epidemiolo epidemiology is. It's looking at effect, cause and effect, in terms of clusters. Um, Legal epidemiology, therefore, is kind of like the marriage between law and science. Um, like other areas of science, it tests theories and hypotheses. Um, it's very systematic. And when students work with me on, on these projects, I tell them, you have to write down how you do it. Because we have to be very systematic, very scientific in our research. It's not just doing a Google search. 
and coming up with the answers. We have to know precisely what search terms were used, how many hits came up, how many were relevant, et cetera. Um, we do this to be uh, transparent. Um, this was really hard for me when I started at Pitt because I was a litigator back in the day, and I wasn't used to sharing my methods with anybody. I didn't want to tell anybody how I did anything. I just did it. Um, and now, as an academic doing this, I have to show my hand. I have to ex not only explain my findings, what I was looking at, but exactly how did I get there, which leaves you kind of vulnerable. Um, when you think about it, but it also build, builds credibility. Um, we also do our research so it can be replicated. Um, at least in theory, if someone uses our methods, they should be able to come up with the same answers that we did. We have to look to precision, and our outcomes also need to be measurable. Um, Legal epidemiology is the study of law as a factor in the cause, distribution, and prevention of disease in a population. But most laws were not proposed or enacted um, with respect to health. They don't look at the health outcomes of what they do. Um, but legal epidemiology does this, exactly. Um, and there are three different um, ways in which they do this. And just ironically, I've developed three tools, and they hit each one of these, which is really nice. Um, one is looking at the legal prevention and control, which is basically looking at the laws that affect the public health system, that system that I showed you before. So it's what do the agents within the public health system have to do. And my project phases, we love acronyms at the University of Pittsburgh. We also like to name things that are acronyms that are people's names. So I, I beg your forgiveness. But um, so my phases project hits that one. Um, policy surveillance. Policy surveillance is basically just looking at the landscape. It's kind of a mapping study, looking at what the laws are and comparing them interjurisdictionally. Um, because as I teach my class, you know, in the United States of America, we're actually a country of 51 countries, especially in terms of public health law. Um, they're all different. and. Um, by mapping them, you can compare them, and you can also come up with best practices. And finally, this is the most, and ELI is my project that addresses that. And finally, um, legal etiology is the study of laws, incidental or un unintended effects on health. And this is the trickiest one to measure. Um, and this is um, Fred Opioid. Um, which is a project I'm currently working on and I'll introduce you to. You'll be at the very forefront of, of the research and I'll show you what we're doing and where we're going to go. Okay, so my first study, the Public Health Adaptive System Study or Phases. This was a CDC uh, funded study um, that used law as data for social network analysis. Do you all know what social network analysis is? I didn't. What it is, it's, it's the relationship between agents. Um, it is looking at, um, it's, it's looking at um, a system and how different individuals within the system work together or not. Um, and there's all sorts of principles. So you can apply, when, once, once you create these maps, you can look at centrality. So that's a concept, which agents are most central to the system? Remember that chart I told you that we were gonna look at? So in that chart, governmental public health was the most central agent. Um, so that's centrality. You also look at stuff like functionality. So that is how frequently do agents have to work together? Um, so if one of those agents goes away, what happens to its partner? Um, so those are just some of the, some of the concepts involved in network analysis. Um, so how do you take law and apply those principles to it? Um, here's our team. Some of them are pictured, some of them are not. It was a really big team. We had four different projects. We were funded by the CDC for five years. And over the course of time, the CDC, as they are wont to do, took away some of our funding. So at the end of the day, we went from four projects down to two. 
And thank goodness, one of those were, was the legal project that I was working on. Um, but the purpose of the grant was to develop tools for emergency preparedness and response. Um, it was so, so different agents in the public health system could plan for emergencies and address emergencies once they occurred. When I started the project, um, I was hired at Pitt initially to write a book on public health law for judges. You can find it online. It's the Pennsylvania Public Health Law Bench Book. Um, and this is a very true story. I told you I was a litigator by background. I walked into my interview um, to write a book for judges on public health law, and I said, what is public health law? Don't do that. Um, even though I was lucky enough to actually get the job, I would advise you to do a wee bit of homework before you go in to know the subject matter that you're going to write a book about. Um, but so when I started this project, um, I knew something about Pennsylvania's law since I had written a book on it. Um, and so I literally took out the code and I opened to a provision and it was a compulsory vaccine law for schools. So I thought, now how can I dissect that and apply for my colleague to apply network analysis, social network analysis? Then I started ruminating, well, what's a school? Is it K through 12? Does it include university? What about homeschooled people? So I'm telling you the story because it took me four months to code Pennsylvania. The, orig the original intent of this project was to code all 50 states. Um, it clearly became, I mean, became very clear that that was not a tenable goal. So what we did was we had to be very systematic in our state selection. So we selected at least one state from each of the 10 Department of Health and Human Services regions, which is broken out here. Um, we also wanted a mix of urban, rural, and frontier states, which information you can get from the census, um, from the census website, census data. We also wanted to mix it up with respect to the type of emergencies these different jurisdictions were facing. So you have earthquakes in California and Alaska, you have hurricanes in Florida, tornadoes in the mid middle of the country, and in New York you had terrorism. So we mixed it up with respect to geographic, um, type, of, type of population, as well as type of emergencies. And in the green you can see the 11 states that we studied. So then we had to come up with search terms. And this is one of the ones we came up with. So you can see why it took me four months to do one state. It took like a month to just come up with this. And um, this makes it though systematic, replicable, and transparent. We ran the same search on all of those 26 agents in that map I showed you. So we looked at all the laws using this for governmental public health and for schools and for elected officials, and for firefighters, and all of those um, individual um, nodes. At the end of the day, we came up with 39,971 hits that we had to review individually. Um, since that time, I've been working with some of my colleagues at the School of Law on using artificial intelligence to do this, because you can imagine, by this time it wasn't just me on the project, um, I, had a, I had a team working with me, but individually going through 39,000 laws to see if they were relevant before we even get to the coding. Um, and so we worked to see if a computer could do this, and um, I, I could do a whole lecture on just that, but let me just say in sum, um, the computer and the humans had the same error rate. Um, so that was very interesting. So the computer could kind of do what humans were doing in this part, but the computer was not able to do the coding like we did, which I'll show you in a second. So to develop this, we called on experts. Um, I used to work at USDA in Washington, D.C., and so I called on some of my colleagues there in the Food um, Safety and Inspection Service, and I said, what kinds of words would you use for foodborne illness? I don't know. So we called on experts to help us. We worked closely with LexisNexis um, to come up with this. We had a national advisory committee um, that also had input. Um, so this was really great because it's very systematic, but it's also a limitation of the study because we were precluded from looking at anything that didn't come up here. 
So when we had those 39,000 hits, when you go to the table of contents, by golly, you'll notice that the one before and the one after are relevant too, but it didn't come up because the right words weren't used. We were precluded from coding those. Um, so that, that is one um, limitation of the study. Um, that's what one of the hits, one of the 39,000 hits came up with. So this is what it looked like. Um, we had to develop some rules for relevancy, so we were all looking at things the same way. So stuff um, um, with respect to MRSA, we were looking at emergencies with a big capital E, so like the Ebola outbreak. Um, 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 so some of, of the emergency laws we had to disregard. Um, we disregarded anything to do with insurance, sorry, Val. Um, HIV, there's a whole slew of laws with respect to HIV, um, but that, that was not the type of emergency we were looking at. Um, and at the end of the day, from those 39,000 laws, we analyzed or coded almost 6,000. And this is how we did it. Here's an example of how we actually assign numeric representation to legal test, text, and that's what we did. Um, again, we needed to be consistent. We needed to be um, objective. Because, you know, when you tell somebody about the law, you kind of summarize it, right? Well, that's, that's extremely subjective. You're going to look at a law differently than I am, and we will interpret it differently. But when you assign numeric representation to words, it's much more consistent. Um, so that's an actual provision. Um, and the top line in blue is how we would code. We had a code book that was about 35 pages long. It was a very iterative pro process because we kept adding to it. Um, and we coded in nine different areas. Um, one was the acting agent. So remember that, that Easter egg kind of map I showed you. So that was the agent who was being told to do something. Um, prescription was whether the action was either mandatory or discretionary. Uh, the action was the goal. So, or I'm sorry, the action was the verb. So it was to prepare, it was to report, um, it was to investigate. So whatever the verb was. Um, the goal was the noun, so a plan, an outbreak. Um, et cetera. The purpose was whether it was for emergency preparedness, response, or recovery. The type of emergency is the type of emergency. Um, so at the end of the day, we found 23 discrete types of emergencies that these laws um, spoke to. A lot of times they put in a global term. Um, so you'll, you'll, you will find laws in Kansas that speak to tsunami. Um, to the best of my knowledge, um, that has not occurred. Um, there. The partner agent is the agent within, with, with which the acting agent worked, so their partner. So the acting agent was told to do something with this entity. Uh, the time frame was a time frame within which something had to occur immediately within 24 hours, et cetera. And finally, the condition was any precipitating factor. So after an emergency is declared, boom, boom, boom. So those were the nine different categories that we came up with. And you know, there are a bunch of laws that have more than one line of code. Um, as a matter of fact, we had 20,000 lines of code. And when you count individual variables, we had 186,000 variables that we coded by hand in pencil on a clipboard. Somebody took those lines of code, put them in Excel spreadsheets. And this is where the magic occurred that I don't really understand. Then they took those Excel spreadsheets and created networks. And this is what it looked like. And hopefully, right now, I'll be able to actually demonstrate it to you. Um, Samantha, are you ready for when I screw up? Okay. I know she is. <laughs> oh, goodness, it's up. Okay, so I don't know how to make my screen big, so this is the whole screen. Is that okay? Okay. 
So this is the tool we created called Lena. And Lena is a visual representation of the legally defined public health system for emergency preparedness. So these are what laws are telling which agents to work together. These are the states. So I'm just going to pick New York. So this is what the public health system looks like in New York for epidemics. Um, I don't know if you can read those. Can you read those headings? So those are all the different nodes. You have home health care. You have physicians. You have all those different agents. They're called nodes in, in social network analysis. But all the different agents listed, you can see the lines that connect them. So the blue lines are uni, unidirectional. So that is one agent is being told to work with one agent, with another agent, but it's not reciprocated. The red lines are um, that you can see in governmental public health, there's a red line with long-term care. So governmental public health was legally directed to work with long-term care, and long-term care was legally directed to work with governmental public health, okay? Um, you can see the agents that are more central to the network. Um, and you can see the ones on the side that have no legal direction uh, in the system. Um, so those are agents that there are no laws or we didn't uncover any laws. As you know, that is a limitation. We don't have every law in the entire universe in here, just the ones that came up in our searches um, for this system. So you can play around with this. Um, if you don't want to look at epidemics, uh, we could look at fires, which is an even more complex system. We could look at earthquakes, and that's what it looked like. Um, the thickness of the lines, again, indicate that agents are told more frequently to act together. And if I'm not going to do it on this, but if you click on the line between them, that's called an edge. In, in network analysis, it would take you to a different data set that has the full text of the laws that mandate the action, okay? So this is one health system. This is in, can you hear me okay? Uh, this is in New York for earthquakes. But what if we want to compare New York to another state, another jurisdiction? Well, over here, let's pull down uh, I'm going to switch back, I think, to epidemic. Okay. And let me compare it to Alaska, because I know Alaska has very few laws. I also, at the end of this, I could read a law and tell you which state it came from. They're all written the same, within the same jurisdiction. It's really funny. Okay, so let's compare it to Alaska. It shows you this map. And what this map is, is a comparison. It's like in the olden days, I know you all are too young, but we used to have um, these projectors with this, um, what are they called? The plastic things. The 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 one on top of it, that's what this is. So it shows you New York with Alaska on top of it. The green lines are the lines or the relationships between the nodes that are apparent for New York only. labs and governmental public health, those are the relations that are relationships that are existed in both New York and Alaska. And the red lines, uh, or the brown lines, I don't know if there are any, but if there were brown lines, those would be relationships existed in Alaska, but not New York. Did you have anything for us to do here? You ready to see something else? So that's using law as data and applying network analysis to it. So as I said, I worked on that project for about five years. Um, and um, from that project, these are just screenshots of what I just showed you. Um, and that, that tool is called Lena. 
again, L-E-N-A, and it stands for the Legal Network Analyzer. And all these tools that I'm showing you are publicly available and free. Um, so, so feel free to noodle around if you ever get bored and feel like being a real nerd. You can, you can go here, and I'll be happy to share the sites with you. Okay, so from that, the next tool was created. And this is ELI. This is what uh, Professor Fersche was indicating. Um, it stands for the Emergency Law Inventory. Uh, we call this the son of phases um, because another call from the CDC came out and said, take a tool that you previously developed, really good use of federal funds, with federal funding, and make something else out of it. So I did. I did. Um, this, is, this represents the second type of legal epidemiology, the surveillance, the, the mapping, the showing you what the laws are. Um, I had only 18 months to do this project, so it was a much shorter time frame um, than the phases um, project. Um, this was my team. We had, uh, since I am the director of the JDMPH program, I employ all JDMPH students. Um, we had a couple of those on the project, another law student, um, project coordinator, a communication specialist, and we also partnered with three different health departments. Um, I had had previous relationships with, with each of these ladies on um, other projects, but um, what we wanted to look at in terms of emergency preparedness were what laws impact volunteers. There's an organization called the Medical Reserve Corps. Are you all familiar with that? Those are the nice people who gave me an award. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group though of over 200,000 volunteers across the United States and territories. Um, and Medical Reserve Corps units are usually housed in health departments. So um, I partnered with Allegheny County Health Department, which is the county that, that Pittsburgh is in. So that was kind of like a no-brainer. We have a really good relationship with them. They have a Medical Reserve Corps um, unit of about um, 600 volunteers. Uh, this is a, my former boss who was on the FACES project with me, who's now the Commissioner of Health a, in Eastern Ohio. It's a very rural area that has only about 200 Medical Reserve Corps volunteers in three counties. Um, and then finally, I was fortunate enough to partner with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, I had worked with them on a different project looking at legal barriers to um, access to primary care following Superstorm Sandy. Um, and this is my friend Betty Duggan. Um, in their Medical Reserve Corps unit, they have 8,200 members. So it was nice because we had input from a small, medium, and large Medical Reserve Corps unit. They're also in different Department of Health and Human Services regions, like I showed you the phases, so there was good variance. We were very systematic in selecting these. Um, and here's the map of the Medical Reserve Corps unit. About 60% of their volunteers are, are clinically based, and about 40% are not. Um, so although this multi Simplicity is great in a lot of ways because they can perform a lot of different functions. It also creates a lot of division across the network because you have physicians and you have me, um, both working in the same unit. Um, and they did a survey from the Department of Health and Human Services and um, about a third of Medical Reserve Corps unit leaders said that um, their volunteers um, unawareness of what the law said was a barrier to getting them to volunteer, and it was also a barrier when they got deployed. You know, they were afraid of liability, for example. So, you know, I know what I'm supposed to do in, in Pennsylvania, but if I get deployed down to Louisiana and I screw up, what's gonna happen? Um, so this impeded volunteer response. So we wanted to create a tool to help with this. This is how we coded the ELI project, it looks a heck of a lot different, doesn't it, than the phases. First of all, we did not use pen and paper in this because I had students driving this instead of me. Um, it, this is a Google Doc form, and they basically clicked on the different topics, what, what legal topic. Instead of looking at a broad scope, we limited to four different areas of law. Um, liability, scope of practice, um, license reciprocity, and workers' benefits. And we limited it to those. We 
performed a lot of focus groups, we talked to the end user. That is critically important. If you're ever going to develop a tool, talk to who it's going to be used by. We talked to them not only in terms of what we were going to put on it, but how was it going to look. I know myself, even though this is not scientific, I know if I go to a website and, and it's not easy to use, it doesn't appeal to me, um, um, it's not pretty, I'll go somewhere else. So I wanted to not only make something that was like TurboTax, it asked you a series of questions and it got you the answers you needed, but I also wanted it to be visually appealing. And it was really interesting because one of our focus group um, gentlemen said, I, I'm colorblind and your use of these two colors, I can't distinguish between them, so could you change them? So we got a, a lot of really, really good input into it. Um, Okay, so that's how we coded it, and at the end of the day, we, in terms of, of um, jurisdictions, we have 60. We have those four areas of law for all 50 states, for the District of Columbia, for the federal government, and for eight U.S. territories. So by limiting the legal scope, we were able to vastly um, expand the jurisdictional scope. So I'll show you this tool now. There we go. Um, again, I'm sorry. I don't know how to expand this. This would be good to see um, the entire thing, but we'll just go with this for now because we're running out of time. So to get to use this tool, you had to get started. Um, next, it asks you to choose your profession because from performing um, our focus group research, we realize that people really only care about the laws that pertain to them. If you're a unit leader, you might want to know what everybody has to do, but basically, if I'm a physician, I just want to know what's, what is going to impact me. So we'll just, for example, hit physician. Oh, there's that virus. <laughs> there's that virus. That comes up every time. And it's going to come up again. It takes about three times for me to hit it, and then it will actually allow me to go where I want to go. Or not. Okay, there we go. So then it asks you where you're volunteering. So what state are you interested? Well, I'm interested in West Virginia. Then the next screen, hopefully, if a virus doesn't come up, is going to ask, has there been a formal emergency declaration? And this is really important because certain laws change after there's been an emergency declaration because it's a formal legal document. So let's say yes. And then it brings you to the landing page. It gives you your four topics down here. It reminds you where you are. You can use drop down menu right here. It gives you a summary of what the law says. Click here to learn more. Then it takes you to the full legal text. Of, of the law. Simple. This contains about 6,000 laws. I mean, I'm sorry, about 1,500 legal summaries um, in this tool on those four topics. And um, I'll tell you, I'm in the process of writing a paper on comparing workers' benefits across state lines. and. This has reduced my legal research from weeks and weeks and weeks to about 35 seconds per state. Um, it's, it's, it's a dream for an academic um, and has been very, fortunately, very, um, very favorably, um, very favorably um, noted by the people who really end up using it. And this, this was the tool that I got the word from the, um, both from, um, the National Medical Reserve Corps program as well as the University of Pittsburgh. We have something called the Innovation Institute and what they do is they take projects that have been developed um, with grant funding and privatize them. So we don't have time to go into it right now but um, my tool has been um, selected 
before this. I, it's, it's been crazy. Um, and we are looking to adapt that tool, keep it legal, tr uh, keep it as Eli open and free for volunteers, but morph it into legal triage. So it's the same paradigm. It's the same a um, asking a series of questions to get to the to get to answers. And what we're looking as the next legal topic is probably telehealth. Um, because a lot of times now, you know, telehealth is great from a public health perspective because it's bringing health care to people in rural communities from one thing that might not have access to specialists. So I'm a big proponent. But there are a lot of legal issues. So if I'm sitting in my office in Morgantown and I'm treating a patient in Florida, you know, do they have the same informed consent laws? How am I reimbursed? All sorts of stuff like that. So you can imagine that same paradigm um, being used for... Um, telehealth. Um, and finally, this is what I'm working on now, and this is going to work out just perfectly. Um, as, as Professor Fourche indicated, um, the opioid epidemic is, is something that I have a great interest in. As a matter of fact, my law and public health practice class for the last three years, um, we have focused on different aspects of the opioid crisis, working directly with the Allegheny County Health Department, answering questions that they feel need a multiple cohort. So I have law students, med students, even students of mine from Carnegie Mellon have, have come and taken my class. So it's a multidisciplinary class. It is absolutely wonderful. And I would love to share my paradigm with you at the University of, of uh, West Virginia College of Law, um, because I think it's something that you might um, benefit in because it's, it's a wonderful experience. So we all know the opioid epidemic is going crazy, right? But it's not going crazy everywhere. It is in Pennsylvania. It is in West Virginia. But in some places, instead of going like this, it's going like this. And we're trying to figure out why. Why is it going like this in certain jurisdictions? And can, if we can figure that out, can we implement that in our jurisdictions where it's going like that? So we are using, in this case, large-scale agent-based modeling. And what that is, it's a predictive analytic that looks at things over time. And when it says large-scale agent-based modeling, it means that the agents, just like in that map, the agents not only have certain characteristics um, like age and gender and employment status and education status, but they also have some behavioral components too. So it's a kind of, it's, it's down to the county level. We have data for every county in, um, across the United States. We know it's a synthetic population. We know what the population looks like in each of those counties and they're represented. And by giving them behavioral components, it's more like real life. So uh, these are just um, some, some of the maps in Pittsburgh, um, looking at race and income and age and household size that we've, we've gotten from um, the Census Bureau. And FRED is a nod to FRED Rogers. Um, it actually stands for the Framework for Reconstructing Epidemiological Dynamics. But its name's FRED because FRED Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? It's all about neighborhoods. Get it? OK. <laughs> so this is a toy model. We have an actual model in FRED, if you go to it, that shows you the effect of vaccine uptake and the infectious disease outbreaks of measles. So it looks at if 80% of the population has been vaccinated, this is what the outbreak would look like if 90%, which is herd immunity, is reached because there's a different impact. So it looks something like this. Did, the, did it already start? So in, in Western Pennsylvania, this is what the opioid epidemic looks like over time. So the blue dots are people who use uh, opioids. The red are people who s s uh, suffer from substance use disorder. And the black are deaths. Okay, so this just looks at it over time, what the epidemic looks like in Western Pennsylvania. OK? So what we're going to do is we have maps like this for, as I said, every county in the United States. So we're going to look at the um, counties where it's skyrocketing and where it's plateauing and <coughs> populate 
models like this with legal interventions. So right now we're piloting looking at medical and recreational marijuana laws. And um, in terms of how we're coding it, um, it's a very difficult coding methodology because we're looking at it over a 10-year period. So first we have to identify the laws um, in these areas that have tremendously bad health outcomes and the ones that have better health outcomes um, over a 10-year period see when the laws became effective, and then code them. And these are some of the categories that we're looking at. This is going to be more like the phases coding, where we're going to have a big code book and assign numeric representation to these areas. But we're not stopping there. After we have done that, then we're going to categorize similar laws. Right? Um, there was an article written in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I actually got angry at my office just because the original professional professor is getting off, and she probably doesn't have it all that frequently. But what that study did is look at medical marijuana laws and coded them in using a binary system. So either yes or no. Do you have a medical marijuana law? Yes or no? Does it have criminalization provision in it? Yes, no. This was making the phases because I'm sorry, there's a difference between getting a $5 fine and going to jail. Right? And those are pretty serious things. Yes, you tell us. So it doesn't matter what law is on the book, it matters what the law has to say. And in order to figure out what it has to say, you've got to drill down. Right? You've got to dissect it, you've got to pull it apart, and then you've got to put it back together. So you look at clusters like John Snow did. So you know that certain geographic areas that have had good health outcomes have similar types of law. But you can't do that by saying yes or no, those are wrong. So stay tuned. I have two students who are working on this right now. Um, they're, they're doing the legal coding. Um, my colleague Ha Ray Jahal is the one who will be performing the magic of putting this into Fred Opioid and seeing if certain jurisdictions with similar types of law have similar or disparate health outcomes. Questions? Did you ever think you could really do stuff like that with the, with the law? I didn't when I started law school. Um, it's amazing to me that, you know, we're able to figure out whether laws work. Any questions? Yes. They're coding all of that. Yes, not when it's enacted, but when it's effective, and it's when it's rescinded, and then what takes over next. It's a very, very complicated coding methodology, one that hasn't been done before, I might add. Yes? The LENA model was not done, done over time. It was, and, and that's another, that's a huge, Yeah, I 
No, the vast majority of you need to be in con law. So, <laughs> can we say thank you to our speaker?